Hello, everybody. So thank, you, thank you for joining us, Brian. No problem. Uh, coming all the way from Galway. Um, just to kick off, let's just get your background. Before we do that, can I ask sure. one question? So when I looked at online and said this ad, this, the event was advertised, you had people to pay for tickets. Who paid for tickets? Very good. Okay, so make sure that you ask a question at the end and get some value. <laughs> right. Who didn't pay for tickets? Who didn't pay for tickets? Well done, startups. <laughs> good call, keep the cash on the pitch. Pizza and the beer. Oh, it's very hot for the fire. And yeah, I heard. What can I say? You know, we put ourselves through the. Need a beach. Yeah, that would be nice. So, Brian, and thanks for joining us. Um, just to, to kick things off, were there uh, influences in your family? Uh, was there an entrepreneurial spirit or something that inspired you to, to, to do what you're now doing? Um, I suppose the biggest inspiration really was I wouldn't have had much exposure to you know, entrepreneurs or, or to business, but my mum and dad just kind of, when we were small, was, were given the chance to, and told, you can do, you can achieve whatever you want, but you're going to have to work hard for it and whatever you want to do will back you. So even when that meant I decided I want to be to do sports science in London, bear, bear in mind I was from Galway, we had an RTC or uh, and a university and I decided I was going to London, which my parents remortgaged their house to give me the chance to go. So I've been given every chance in that regard, so I think blessed like that. Brilliant. And growing up, were you a mechanical kid or was it the sporting side of things that sort of excited you sports just okay. all day 24 7 out the door out the gap football basketball swimming the olympics Amy Coughlin winning anything Sonia Sullivan on the tv i was just obsessed so really i suppose that's the kind of a, a big driver of what we're doing in terms of oracle but it's a love of sport all sport and did you initially pursue actual uh, competitive sport yourself before getting involved in the sports science side of things yeah i was big into running and uh run you know whatever for Galway City Harriers and then into community games and all Ireland's that kind of stuff and m made a few like a, a national a training squad for the Irish team but never got the full international my girlfriend she's the international in our house so I'm firmly in my place um, but uh, no I still when I started I, I, I lived and trained with the Kenyans for a while as part of my studies and I worked out very quickly I was going to run against these guys for my lunch I was going to be a hungry boy do something else and get fast and quick at it so <laughs> That's where it started from. And did you took up this is sports science in, in the UK? Yeah, yeah, in Strawberry Hill. I was actually, I was driving down here and I remembered it's fabulous the chance. So thanks very much for the invitation and thanks for coming and uh, buying the tickets. <laughs> Thank you. Glad um, to have you here. Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's fabulous. And I actually came, I was thinking, how do we it all get started? I, I came to an open day at UL and Professor Craig Sharp stood on stage and he said, this is sports science, this is what we do. My head nearly fell off. I thought, what? How amazing is this? From the recovery to sleep to training, like Craig, what's the fastest land animal? Does anyone know? Cheetah. Cheetah, how do you know? Cheetah. Sorry? David Attenborough. David Attenborough. If you just look at the Guinness Book, Book of Records, you'll find the fastest time was Professor Craig Sharp, where he timed, hand-timed his own pet cheetah three times over 200 yards. And the way he did it was he put a slab of meat over the back of the truck, gun the truck, <laughs> And that's the fastest time recorded for a cheetah. So this is the guy, like, he was amazing. And he, you know, I went, I got the opportunity to go to Strawberry Hill. And the UL got, I remember chatting to UL, they said, well, you've got the chance to crack, go. And my first day I landed there. You know, I grew up in Galway watching Golden League and Sonia and Oslo and Zurich and the Valklasse and on the black and white telly with my mum. And next thing, first day I landed with my bag and Moses Kipsinui, the Kenyan runner. Have you heard of him? Yes. Like, world record holder. Um, uh, it ran straight past me and I properly forest gumped it, dropped the bag, <laughs> ran after him in the jeans. He was like, who's this crazy white guy running after me? And I was like, I might never get this chance again. Well, actually, it was a bit embarrassing because he lived around the corner and he ran the same loop every evening. <laughs> but, um, he, 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 you can't, sorry, just enough for him to kind of get frightened and so, all right, I need to move. But, uh, you know, I suppose that, that kind of evolved, like six years later, I was in his house taking his blood samples. So it was just, you're just exposed to a level of competition. Like our, our, our tennis coach was Wayne Ferreira and Amanda Coach's coach. Our rugby coach was um, the England kicking coach. So you're just exposed to, like, I was like, it was like Willy Wonka for me. You know, all my buddies in doing maths and engineering. What are you doing? Football. 
And how did the evolution of um, Oracle come about? How did the early early seeds get sown? Um, I started with um, uh, as part of my undergraduate project a simple idea about is the blood of an athlete different to the blood of a non-athlete? And my father ran the laboratory in Galway. His, his name's Joe. One day when I was about 12, I was probably the same age as Finn, I asked, I, I called him Joe. He didn't really react, so he was Joe after that rather than dad. And I said, Joe, I want to run some bloods. He said, no way. And I said, come on. And he said, okay. So we ran them at 11 o'clock at night, 10 normals, 10, 10, 10 athletes, and to see the difference. And there was one result that was really amazing. It was very different to anything we'd seen. Is he hematologist? He was, yeah, yeah, biomedical scientist in hematology. He could sit in the blood. Oh. Sorry. He's a cracker with the cheese. That's fabulous. <laughs> oh, yes, you could say that's definitely a good call. Okay. Um, is your background marketing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you could say it's in the blood. And my mum was a biomedical scientist in cytology. So, but the last thing I wanted to do as a kid was be anywhere near a lab. No way. But the, the mad thing was there was this one result and it was like a very interesting profile and in 20 odd years I hadn't seen it so I said to my dad Joe so what, what does that mean he said well you're the genius I'm sending to London a very poor exchange rate there's the library knock yourself out and it kind of started there I was like got this crash course in hematology trying to understand what was going on and uh, long and short of it you know we might have heard about the EPO where people would take EPO like a, a hormone so this person was accelerating production I was like wow um, and we stumbled across a test for EPO back then in 1997 and no one really listened to us because I was a kid and how would you do that when the world can't and between us we had actually stumbled across it and eventually I, I sold everything I, own, I owned in 1999 to go to quit my job as a PE teacher to go to the Sydney Olympics Sonia was racing I just started to work with her and um, went to the Australians and they laughed and said yeah you were actually ahead so um, and then they took me on to their program so for two years I spent traveling the world through the Rift Valley in Kenya through Australia through the US and it was just it was just an amazing opportunity but I suppose that's where it kicked off for me anyway. and was that as Arico or did that come that was as my a PhD okay so I had this idea kind of really wanted to do it the idea got slammed initially as an undergrad which is a good lesson you know and um, they said look you're we're not interested in you doing this you, you know, change the world. You just wanted to show that you can do basic study. Okay, so I went and uh, started working with the Kenyan runners, so Moses and Daniel Coleman and Sally. And I tried to say, can we use these numbers to help the athletes go faster? The anti-doping piece came in because I was passionate about it, and uh, you know, all our athletes were being robbed for a long time, and I was like, well, you could use this as a tool to to detect. So I worked for two years validating the EPO models. So you might have heard about the Lance Armstrong thing where people are looking around, look at a blood passport. So your values are maintained at a very normal level and they go up and down with training. So we need to understand that. What happens when you go up to the mountains? What happens when you're in warm weather? What happens when you come into competition? So all of a sudden you start to see, it's not about the numbers, it's the context. And that's where it kind of kicked off, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when did you actually start the company as a, as a commercial entity what was was there an early business model did you see it as a having business potential yeah it was interesting i i um like i started work for S- sydney athens and then the beijing olympics and at that stage i worked with about 20 odd olympic medalists and i could really see there was patterns in the data that were corresponding when people were going well or maybe not so well and you know we're all familiar you know, we're all working hard and sometimes you can work really hard, but the law of diminishing margin returns applies. You put more and more in, get less and less back. So believe it or not, there's signals that are carried under your hood that will give you a warning sign. So we did a lot of work with Sonia back then. She was so far ahead of the game in understanding her body and understanding how, how that worked. And we, we were involved in some pretty big calls. Like Sonia wrote about it in the Irish Times, so I can talk about it. Otherwise, I wouldn't really speak about it. But, you know, she wasn't going to... She was, really not going to go to race in Sydney because she had a really bad race in in London and was, you know kind of go through it again but with the data we knew that it was just a short-term overreach and she went back 10 days later and broke broke the national record and then went on and what got a silver in the Olympics so there's real power in the data once you know what you're looking at um, and then I suppose when I was in Athens I bumped into Paul Rick Okeja from Air Aaron man he's like like a uh, 
like a firecracker. He's got so much energy. Although I was talking to Keith Wood yesterday, he said I was like a can of Fanta that was shaking. <laughs> I don't think it's a bad thing, but Padraig had a lot of energy, and I'd seen what he did with Air Aaron from, from you know out to the Arab Islands all the way to you know the UK and build that whole network. So that was really interesting. And then I thought, look, there's something in this, but it needs a lot more work. Pretty much got, kind of got fired before the Athens Olympics because I flagged kind of a scenario. I said, okay. I'm concerned about some of the athletes and I think that they, they were maybe overreached but I didn't really have enough evidence to really stand over it was very anecdotal so then that was the, the point for me I said I need to get proper evidence I had evidence but I needed proper data science that's where that kicked off and then so I stepped out in I, after the Beijing Olympics in 2008-9 and then spent a year on my own just kind of building things and kicked it off in 2010. So we mentioned Paul Cage earlier. Did he inspire you with his entrepreneurial? Oh yeah, you can't. But you can't fail, but yeah. be inspired by him. What he's done and so much energy. And he was so um, generous with his time. And I, I find that if in this startup land, people are so generous. If you just ask, and the best people are often the nicest and the most approachable. Just go. I loved when you went through the the charter. Where you said, look, you know, it's about giving, not asking, and you're making friends, not contacts, because. There's, we're all it's, it's a grind it's it's tough you need support and sometimes you can feel you're going slowly mad like I started in a box room and my only contact with people was to go down to the, the Strand Hill and talk, get, get a bit of lunch and it was almost like the shining all work no play my ex-Jack the old boy because you can you just get so focused on it but it's all about people and, and growing it so important. yeah well Derek Anderson who founded this this about six years ago he really wants to keep those values because yeah. he'd seen lots of um, keynote addresses or networking groups and he said there's room for something in the middle where you can network with people who've been there and, and, and walk the walk and and, um, and also to have a uh, teleformal chat like this but to keep those values of, of the of generosity of between startups in uh, mentors and people starting off in the valley so so that's good um, at what stage did you meet your co-founder and how important was it to, to, to share the burden once you, once you were on the, the grind? Yeah, um, my co-founder is Dr. Andy Hodgson. He's the complete opposite of me in so many levels. One, he's tall. <laughs> Two, he's, like a, he's a proper physician. I'm a paper doctor, which he always reminds me about. Um, but he was amazing because he, we complement each other. Like I'm the kind of Fanta, he's steady. And between the two of us, we'll find a path. You know, it's easy to get excited about stuff, but you need to, the rigor to, to, to follow through. So I, I think it's it's really helps if you have a co-founder. Um, Andy was you know has a full time job, but you know if ever you needed him, he was he was there in evenings or weekends or if you and he was on our board and he he, he, he we had great fun in the early days. I used to turn up for our board sessions in a suit. Just the two of us, like, where are you going? Yeah. I said, look, if we're serious, we want to be a listed company, we need to get this type of rigger going. He said, all right, so fine. But you've got, suit. yeah, exactly, in the suit, the whole lot, had the minutes. You said. <laughs> so, um, but I think, yeah, you just need someone that kind of back, backs you. He put the very first money in alongside me, and we said, look, let's have a go with this, because we could see there was a gap. So you went back to working in the bedroom? Yeah. For a year. Yeah, great. What was that like? I mean, was it depressing? Did you get demotivated or was it a necessary sort of... Needs must, really. I kind of had just went out on my own and had to kind of start from scratch effectively. Um, and it was a bit grim, but that's okay. You know, you just got to... It's a grind. You've got to work. I could see what I was going to... But back then, I was talking about with, like, um, Professor John Newell. So he's the other kind of real important piece of the jigsaw for us. So when... I met him when I was doing my PhD and helped me with the stats because we didn't have a Scooby-Doo what was going on, to be honest. Anyone who tells you they do, they probably don't. But when you speak to experts properly, you know, um, the whole other world opens up. And so we were talking about type of AI, machine learning, machine intelligence, all that type of stuff, you know, in back then. But you might as well be on the moon in some regards. So that's why the first time I went to the Australian Institute of Sports was like, like I said, going to Willy Wonka or everything you can dream is there and everyone's on your same wavelength. And that's why it was it was kind of hard. But then I got onto the AI Propel program and that gave me the start with 10 other people in the same boat you could share war stories with. And I'm glad to mention the AI because we have someone here from the AI. Great, so no, they're brilliant. So wouldn't be will I ask him? Yeah, that's great. Wouldn't so how, how did that work for you? Can you explain what Propel did? It, it crash course in entrepreneurship for over 10 weeks, kicked the living bejesus out of everything. 
uh, every idea you have shred it start again and kind of got re- got you ready to be to talk to investors so one of the like the great thing about pork he used to give me so much time but a few times he very tough love pretty brutal which you need so that was like whew, trying off oh, tears no you're more thinking oh shit i need to get organized here and get better and they push you on so that got us to a point where we could go and talk to investors and our first ever investor was brian patterson who was this uh, chairman of vodafone he was ceo of wedgwood and I, I always said look we want to build something that could could list potentially so that's what i did i went and found some and people thought i was mad but brian was brilliant but he made the decision i think to back me after seeing me turn up early and i was trying to ho- hold the door open for someone he said i think this guy's okay and then pitched the idea he said i tend to mad that one's quite good and we kind of took it from there brilliant and you've had like is it four and a half million up to now four and a half million yeah a couple of big rounds or lots of steps uh two small rounds of like so the first ei one that was tough like it was 2010 into 11, uh, 2011 and i was like when everything was going to hell in the handbasket so it was t- i did personal guarantee you know, european investment bank fund so you know everything I had just sold out it was me and the nissan Primera and everything and you had the boot and take it from there so that's kind of where it started and um so we did uh eib and e- and then they did a bes round with a view we always wanted to do add on through bes because we thought it would be great want to have Irish investment and then started them an angel round. So Pa Nolan, who was in Fexco, he kind of led our first round, really a proper one before this, the, the London Olympics. So in that gate, we had six medalists in London and it kind of took off from there and we got our first ever Premier League client. And that was a big one for us. So, yeah, this is a nice opportunity to reflect on all this stuff. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. We're just having a sort of, it's like a counseling. therapy counseling. Yeah. Give me snazzy, snazzy marketing line. <laughs> in the blood. I won't ask you to tell, tell us more about your childhood. But, That's fine. Um, <laughs> tell us about your clients. What type of businesses do you with you now and sort of how you gradually got traction. So you, you got some investment and you put that back I, I guess into promotion and marketing and research was it? It was all into research. We didn't really do much in the way of promotion um, because like at the core of everything like this stuff is expensive um, in terms of what you're trying to do. So like we were always um, profitable the core business. But everything we did was the investment we raised and any extra went straight back into R&D and to, to kind of evolve. And for me, it feels like, I don't know, sometimes you ever see the, the hand gliders when they jump off. Have you ever done, has anyone here hand glided? No, I don't, I don't. But it looks kind of, it's kind of, I always look at it like this is kind of what it's like. So you've got something very flimsy, you've got like a proof of concept, you've got a lot of ideas. But we had back and also I've got 30 Olympic medals. What go wrong? Well, yeah, what could go wrong? Jumping off a cliff, but we had 30 Olympic medalists. But there's a find the Olympics are every four years. I play every week, so it's try to get over that. You know, say so, well, physiology is physiology, and recovery. If you're not recovered, that's going to hurt. So it kind of started from there. But you kind of meet, you jump off, and you're you're going around, and you're you're doing what you do, and then you hit these thermals, and they just lift up to a different level. And the thermal was meeting Brian Patterson or um, Tom Kilale from Amazon investing. He wrote out of the blue. I thought, honestly thought it was one of the guys winding me up. Totally thought, yeah, clever. You know, it's one of the lads messing. But VP of technology at Amazon, right. been following us, and then reached out. And then I kind of hit like two days of, like a whole series of diligence where yeah, I thought it was, you know, you hear about the rugby guys and girls playing Pro 12 and then stepping up to the national team or then stepping up to the Lions. It just takes your breath away because the speed that people like Tom, operate at or John Maloney or Fergalimi or in Germany, they move very quickly so you have to get up to that pace. So it was things like that that kind of really kicked us on um, and our clients would be, you know, our first NBA client was a big deal, um, like I grew up watching the NBA and the basketball. Do you know what I'm Cops, no? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I think um, the NBA or um, Premier League or Podrick Harrington was a big supporter of us in the early stages and Podrick and Graham both kind of use our services and then the wow, I can see this. So and then like, like the with athletes, yeah. you know, it's, it's quite measurable. It's all about timing and, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's quantifiable. <coughs> when you move from, from running then to like um, NBA yeah. or team sports, that, that's more difficult, isn't it? To measure how your performance is? Totally, I was like the, uh, the kind of one of the breakthroughs where we started to work with the British Olympic sailing team. And uh, I, I joke with them, uh, some of our best friends still to this day, they said, you're going to work with the sailing team. I thought, what am I going to do with these people? These guys, less gin, more tonic, 
more gin last night. <laughs> I'm, you know, this is my own bias. I was like, I don't really know a lot about sailing. But when I went down, I was like, holy God, they're on the water for five, six hours. There's huge forces, the winds, you know, they're qualifying very windy venues. They've got a race when there's light winds, so they've got to, you know, drop body weight. They've got, some of them are racing America's Cup. Totally my complete bias. But all of a sudden you start to see that if your sleep is, is compromised, it's going to affect your recovery. If your nutrition isn't right, your ability to um, to perform is compromised. If you overdo it, again, you're going to be in the same boat. And we've all seen our favorite teams. You hear, they're flying and training. And then get to the championship and poof. And it's a very fine line. So using the data, you can push, find the lines, find the sweet spot. And basketball, <coughs> they have amazing schedule, like a phenomenal schedule. They're flying transit uh, across the continent. They finish a game at 11 at night. They're on a plane at two or three in the morning. They land at five or six. So it's just, it's just so tough, not just on the players, but also on the staff. And that was one of the things I learned uh, talking to McLaren F1. We went in talking to them and they, they look at the pit crew. They take that as seriously because they're making decisions under pressure. So, so are we. So if we, if we don't look after those things ourselves, it, it affects the quality of our decision making. And sometimes you kind of forget it. And I definitely deprioritize that side of my um, in my own training, in my own awareness of that, I just, just smash and get it done. But actually learning then that if you do that, it's law of diminishing marginal returns. And you went from sort of football, sailing, NBA to Formula One. Did you have a big sales team or was this all personal recommendation? Yourself, just yeah. hustling? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How did you access to all these? They're very small worlds. Right. Um, and if you can add value, you're interesting. If you don't add value, you're gone, which I like. So what happened, I think it started with Dr. Liam Hennessy, started us with Padraig Harrington, and then people, you know, work with Padraig, started with him before, before he won his majors in 07, 08, and then kind of evolved, and um, people kind of hear about you, and then you get a chance, and um, yeah, it's about understanding the demands of each individual place, and rather what you've got, it's how can you help them, and that was very interesting. So um, amazing when you get into your first NBA team, um, or now we're, one of our clients is the Dallas Mavericks and Mark Cuban is the owner and he did that deal so you're just pff, it's another learning experience he's a multi-billionaire he's on top of his email I should be too <laughs> you know? is Mark Cuban an investor? Uh, not where he's a customer customer? yeah wow um, so give us a 101 on artificial intelligence cognitive computing you know how biometrics works with that and I know you have a very close relationship with IBM Watson. Yeah, um, I mean it's a, it's a real. It's, um, has anyone watched Zoolander? Yeah. <laughs> I like artificial intelligence so hot right now. Everyone's <laughs> talking about it. Everyone's doing it. Uh, it. Sounds very complicated. It is kind of complicated, but ultimately it's quite simple. It's tried to improve decision making, and there's different ways of doing it. Um, you've got you know uh, supervised or unsupervised learning. So what we have is loads of noisy data. So um, Quivers would monster. And you've got data from the, your day job is really busy. You've got GPS data, sleep data, hydration data, jump data, match stats, and it's like, how do you start to analyze that? And so what we've done is use the machine learning to um, identify hidden patterns of the data. So for example, I saw I saw a pattern, and uh, I, I was con convinced about it. But our um, head of analytics would say, faces in the clouds. We can all look at the same data and go, oh, there you go. But what you need is something more robust. So he had unsupervised learning to see if he'd find a pattern and the machine found the pattern. So I knew it, I knew I wasn't, going, I wasn't mad. But it's nice to have that backup. And then you start refining it, layering more information on top of it and finding the signal and noise. Where we're using IBM Watson, people might have, has anyone heard of Watson? Yeah. Yeah, so you might have heard of it, like the, where it came to prominence was the, um, it beat Jeopardy, the game yes. show. Yeah. People are like, wow. And where we're using it is, um, so a lot of structured data, we talked about GPS or heart rate data. We, it's, pretty, it's very good at unstructured data. It wasn't quite plug and play. We, we appointed a PhD in history, uh, Dr. Ewan Newell to come in and help us to, because it's literally reading. And so we were, sometimes you, know, you can see it freaks the team, but you can see it learning. And we're using it to analyze coach notes, um, the latest scientific journals. No one can keep on touch on top of everything. It's just walls of it. So we can now build knowledge bases using Watson so you can rapidly search within your documents and then you pull it up in context. So I have a fatigue player or I'm going to altitude or right tonight Oregon Track Club are racing in Sacramento in 110 degree heat. 
So we've pulled all the hydration, all the cooling strategies, it's gone to Coach Roland. So is Watson the equivalent, IBM's equivalent of Apple's Siri and Amazon's um, Alexa and so on? How do they differ from each other? Well, they're all, I think, they're all trying to do the same, <coughs> same thing. I think um, that's, you know, what, what we're doing is everyone's got their own version. I think it's going to come, it'll be plugged into, it is coming, it's plugged into a lot of applications that we're all using. When I move, can, you, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, you know, plugged in application, we're using, writing, in addition to that, we're writing our own code. So we're doing a lot of stuff in R and use Python and to basically build our own models on top of it. And that's when it's getting very exciting. But I think it's like, as Mark Cuban said, if you're not doing this in your field, you'll be devoured in five years time because it's, it's moving so fast. So um, for us, it's just exciting to, it's another part of what we can do. We can really scale it. Um, What's your business model? It's, uh, right now it's B2B, so it's working with uh, pro teams, athletes, and, and, and federations. Longer term, we want to go B2C, so our first step with that was launching Fitter Women that we launched um, last, last week in Boston at the Female Athlete Conference. And it's designed specifically for female athletes to help tailor training and nutrition across the menstrual cycle to get the best return on your training. So, um, you know, that's, that's ultimately where we'll go, is the learning from the elites. So imagine having the Olympic tra- coach in your pocket. You know, that's, that's what, so we're building the world's first AI assistant coach. You'll never replace the coach. In the same way, I think there's a lot about like machine, machine learning as a service, which is fine, but that's, someone described to me, that's like getting a jumbo jet to, get, to go to the shops. So it's very powerful, but do you actually need it? You know, and is it unwieldy? So you need to be unsure sure of what you're using. How do you charge? Lots, we charge lots. How, how do you measure that? How, is, it, is it by time, is it, is it contracts? Yeah, no, so it's, it's very high end service. So it's like, right now it's bespoke consultancy for every team. Uh, in sports tech, I think there's, there's a lot of platforms there and they're pretty much kind of forcing teams to come into, into their platform and this is the way of working, which is fine. But what we're finding is the teams want to do build their own systems and but the teams are stretched so we come in we have like 30 there's team 32 we've got a split of sports science and data scientists and we come in and tackle their problem and so that's where it's the starting point is um and so for some teams it could be around um look at load monitoring and identify the sweet spot some would be to say can we estimate the gps loads for this player in this position and make smarter decisions about training some could be want the nutrition but as this evolves so where we have it is so you've got a knowledge base, you've got a scenario, a situation, a scenario and a solution. The situation is, this is the player, this is what's going on with the athlete, this is where they're at and this is, like, okay, what do we do? And then, then you start pulling on neural nets and you can start re- pulling on recipes or particular foods because they've got anti-inflammatory properties, and, but it'll all be personalized to you. Wow, and uh, is it scalable to, to, to a gen- general sort of consumer, uh, your, your weekend warrior, your marathon runners, um, triathlons and all that, you know, is there, is, there, is there a model there that you're going to be able to bring it to the masses? Absolutely. I think um, th- th- that's why True Ventures invested in us. Um, so True were the first backers of Fitbit um, and Peloton and Athos. And they see it as this is the where next. So to, to, to really, I think, to differentiate yourself in this space, you need to have, you can have the machine learning and the AI component of it, but you really need to have the deep domain expertise. You need to have proprietary data sets and you need to have all these working together. So it's literally full stack with AI built into it. And then that drives your solutions. So will it be just an app that people can use? Yeah, that, yeah ultimately it will be. And if, you know, it'll give you, kind of help you, like the most precious thing we all have is time. I appreciate that everybody came here you know, some people paid, other people just snaked in the back. Right? Um, we all came in to um, spend an hour of our, our, of our lives together and you want to return on that. And there was nothing worse than you see, I you get so upset for people when you see them train for a London Marathon or a Dublin Marathon and like either never run again or get hurt in the build up because they're just making mistakes that they don't really know. And so, yeah, it, that, that's where it's going to go. And then, you know, right now we, we talk about, um, we've got biomarkers. We look at your hematology, your biochemistry, look at your iron, look at your immune system. And we partner with amazing people. Like we've got Professor Carlo Brunyara at Harvard. We've got Professor Ricky Simpson at NASA, University of Houston. We have um, 
for John Higgins at MIT, like amazing people. To, so you're going to have access to that in your pocket, driving the intelligence built off those data sets, but then customized to you based on your Fitbit, based on what you're doing. And I think that's potentially very powerful, and that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. So I guess, you know, layered on top of your discovery that, you know, using hematology and biometrics combined with AI there was something really valuable they got, it sounds like you've been the middleman matching what you were doing, bringing in all the heavy hitters. It was a really important component too. So a lot of those people are sports scientists and, and technical. Then bring in someone like Keith Wood, former lead sportsman, who's now a, a big tech investor, sports yeah. tech particularly investor. That, that brings a whole new dimension to, to things like this, right? Big time. I think, um, like my job, I think, is to, uh, as the CEO is a couple of things. It's set the strategy, you know, and, the vi- and set the, you know, have the vision, set the strategy with the board, and then, you know, build a team and recruit the best people that we can in every aspect. I don't care where you are, who you are, where you come from. If you're good, I'm interested in talking to you. And then get the hell out of the way. So Keith is very good because it was actually it was down to Lorraine, my girlfriend. She was watching him on the BBC one day and said, you need to get him involved. Because he speaks very articulately, can communicate what's going on in the pitch in a way that we can all understand. And, you know, he'll say it himself, like, you know, he took no prisoners. So everybody sits up a bit straighter in the boardroom when Keith walks in. But we've got a very nice mix. You've got Tom from Amazon, Fergal from Coilcha, you've got Phil from True Ventures, myself. And so, but at every time it's building complementary teams. I think the All Blacks have a no asshole rule. So we try to have, implement the same because everyone's trying to try and to work as hard as they can. And you just, it's got about work the team. team. So Keith acts as a foil for our executive team to, as a resource. You know, I don't know if you've seen him in any of the Lions documentary. You know, he gives you those pep talks. Mm. You walk a bit taller and Absolutely. get at it again. So. so putting together the whole team, then how important is it for you as CEO and, and founder to be involved in recruitment? Do you, are you still involved in all your hires? Yeah, I would talk to everybody. I trust my team to find the talent and we go through a process and, um, and then, you know, make sure that there's a fit. Because the technical stuff you can find, but I think it's the... It's the emotional intelligence, the softer stuff the, that you, you have to work at and we're all trying, every, like everyone's trying their best. So, you know, we're trying not to get too excited or too upset over anything, but we're really passionate about what we do. So. Brilliant. It's an amazing story. Was there anywhere along the, along the way that you made some ridiculous mistake that you uh, regret? All the time. Every, all the time. Like, I remember before I got cage, I said, how do you sleep? He said, I sleep like a baby. What does that mean? I said, oh, I wake up every three hours screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty accurate, you know. There's just constant the problems and decisions and challenges and mistakes. And, but I think that's where sport helps. That's, you know, I, was, I love this. You're always going to make, you're never going to have a perfect game. So, um, but it's about, it's about how you respond to it and how you work with, with your team and how you handle I think yourself in those situations. So we all make mistakes. Um, I'm making them all the time. But uh, I, the only thing that does my head in is making avoidable mistakes. Oh, I beat myself up over those because, you know, but so that's why you surround yourself with people that are a lot smarter than you are, which I do. And yeah, we're So funding is a big part of the CEO's role, yeah? Is that a distraction yeah. from building a company? A lot of people say it's almost a full time job. It is a full time job, yeah. Yeah, I think it is, I think, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. It's about finding the right people, but you've got to have the work done. You, can, the, you know, at the, at the end of the day, people are looking for a return on their capital, and they're investing in you and the story and your credibility and your what you've done. But ultimately, it's like, yeah, what's my return on my hard-earned capital? So, like, I just had a little, we just had a little baby twelve weeks ago, and I remember Theo Pafidis used to say, "Why am I giving you my kids' inheritance?" And I, now, like you know, I, like I, my boss, I have a board that I report to. But now I have, like, I have a boss at home, and then I have this fella that I work for now. So that's the way I think of it. In the same way, it's people's hard won one cash or at the fund, and they all have LPs. So yeah, we have to be really, really prudent and very, like, tight with the money. Make sure that when you spend it, you get the best return on on the investment. So, yeah, but it was definitely a journey. I think there's a huge opportunity. You don't have to go to. If you do go to venture for, for venture funding, we were blessed with great angels like Pa or John Wally or Dennis Jennings who were all who could see it and buy into your long term vision. Um, and then to get the, the venture part was to Can you explain to people who might know the difference between an angel investor and a venture capitalist. Yeah, so look, um, 
an, an angel is typically like a private individual who's um, maybe a high net worth individual who's done done well for themselves and has a capital they want to deploy. Typically, you'll be a smart part, a small part of their portfolio. Sometimes you can be. It's you know, it's the friends and family, which is tough when you take on money from your friends and your family. You want to make sure that you don't lose it. So uh, an angel will maybe step up from that where they have fund and they'll typically look at they want some risk in their portfolio and that's where you come in. A VC is obviously it's more it's an institutional investor. Um, tend to be very rigorous in terms of their diligence. They have a portfolio of companies that you either fit or don't fit. Um, and they have huge amounts of capital to deploy, um, but it's very competitive. So you might have heard, so you go through the different raises from like, a, like your angel round to a seed round and through a series A and B and it keeps going. And you've got amazing examples of that. Like from here, the Collison brothers, what they're doing in Stripe is phenomenal. Multi-billion dollar valuation. So there's a, there's a, there's a well-worn path. Um, there's a lot of good resources that you can um, pick up. I think great books like them, The Hard Thing and the Hard Things with Ben Horowitz or Founder's Dilemma or Thinking Fast and Slow Kahneman. There's loads of great resources out there um, and, and you, it is possible to do it, um, but you, it's a, it's a, it does take a lot of work. How important is picking the right VCs to suit the, the culture of the company and do people get too caught up in, in, in the percentage of equity they give away? I th- yeah, I think, yeah, it's the classic, you know, 100% of nothing is nothing. So uh, I think for me, I've always had a, an attitude of the people that are working in our business, you know, are part of our journey. So the, the equity piece was never really a motivator for me. Of course, you have to look at it and you look at the dilution and at the end point when there is an exit, you want to be in a position to get a return on your hard work because you're risking everything. And then you put your ask, also asking your, your team to risk to come and join you on this crazy crusade. and. Uh, I think picking the right VC is very important. Doing your diligence and f- talking to the other companies in their portfolio, and um, uh, you know, look at where where they're based and what they do, and uh, the huge opportunities for as companies because we've got smart people. But I think sometimes we just need to back ourselves. Sometimes it's hard to get uh, that type of backing here in this country. Um, being based out of Galway. Um, you're, you know, you're operating globally, and you just when I say this recently opened an office in LA. Was that your first US? We had an office, office in Boston, and then we just um, migrated that across to, to LA. Okay. Um. So, it's, yeah, it's, it's so it's fabulous. The sun is shining. Just gonna buy rollerblades. It's gonna cost me a fortune in waxing, but we'll live with it. <laughs> um, um. Yeah. So the LA office is uh, was open last Wednesday, and. Uh, so you're on both cool. West Coast now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, how important is it having boots on the ground in the States in terms of sales and, <coughs> and um, you know, getting, getting recognised in the market? And Hugely important. I think, you know, when you think about it, like in the early days, we were saying, first of all, we we're talking about some maybe some crazy ideas, and then two, who are you? Where are you from? You know, so uh, in the early days, I was joking with Andy that I wanted, we were going to call the company Wiz Analytics. I was going to wear his Sligo. They were like, I get it, but where is Sligo? Like, where is Ireland? And then, what? Why would, should we trust multi-million dollar assets to some, okay, you've got PhDs, but what have you done? So to get the first one in each um, kind of vertical, whether it's the NBA or NHL or Major League Baseball, was very important. And then, it's, but it's important anytime. If you want to, if you buy a car, you want to know that the people that are close by, if anything goes wrong, or equally that you can lean on them. And so having a presence, is very important. So I spent for the first few years, spent an awful lot of time on planes, and um, we're in the process of relocating full time uh, before the end of the year. So um, yeah, it is very important to, to look after your clients, and uh, you get very invested. Why LA rather than San Francisco? Well, again, you know, I think you know it'll help for my modelling um, uh, <laughs> career. I think it could take off. Look at these hands, but. <laughs> Um, I think LA was interesting because it's. I think a lot of people go to San Francisco, and there's a lot of VC. But we got LA was like this um, eight, eight pro teams very close to us geographically. There's really interesting stuff happening um, in uh, you know Google are there, Red Bull High Performance are there, um, and you know it's a pleasure to spend some time with Dr. Andy Walsh and you know Felix Baumgartner who jumped from space. 
Africa. I remember that oh, yeah, space yeah, jump. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. So, so his performance scientist is an Aussie called Dr. Andy Walsh. He's based there. So, I spent time with him. And I'll tell him everything. I'll show him this is what we're working on. He'll go, yeah, that's good, or maybe not. Um, and that's very exciting. So, when you get that kind of validation across all these different areas, then you know you're on the right track. So, I'd be very open about work, what we're working on because, bottom line, if we can't deliver on it, then we deserve to get taken out. There's someone working hard to, um, to, to do what we do, so that's why I want to be there first. Brilliant. Um, amazing story. Um, before we get to the audience, because I know there's loads of questions for you, um, can you give us your top three tips for startups? Your experience. Is that, is that 45 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, Near enough. Well, I'm a long time for questions. Four tables. Four tables. Very good. Yeah. I can see they have a lot of questions, so I give you a lot of time for that. So I think um, like one of the things like when I started off, the was things that kept me going was like um, really it's like it's important I think to love what you do because it's going to get hard, and you, no matter how much you love something, it, like it's the grind. Um, I think you have to you have to think big. You know, to have a look and say like what, what, how big could this be? And but within real, you know, being realistic, and then then to work really smart and hard. Love what you do. Think big. Work smart and hard. And then and that's all. That's lovely. That's very fluffy. But then I think it's a couple of things that keep me going. Is like Jerry Maguire. What Jerry? What's the line from Jerry Maguire? Show me the money. Show me the money. Right. So look, it's a commercial enterprise. Show me the money. Brian, <laughs> sorry. Well, you have me at home. Yeah, you have me at home. Yeah, there you go. I think you meant first one though. <laughs> Exactly. So um, that's what Pat said when I met him first. Amazing. But um, yeah, like it's lovely to do. Think big, work smart, and hard. They're the things that are going the right. But then <coughs> show me the money. So two things is like you run out of cash, you're dead. Brian Patterson. No matter how painful it is, look at your cash balance every Monday morning. And so that's really really important. Um, you know when you are deploying capital, make sure you're getting a return on it. And then the other one is the A team. Always think of the A team. Like so, who's in the A team? He has. Mr. Mr. T. Mr. T. Hannibal. 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 Face. The crazy guy. Face. Murdoch. Yeah. Murdoch. Yeah. Murdoch. Yeah. So you basically need to build. You build your your A team of people that you you trust and that can help you to, to get where you want to get to, and that you know that is, is in it for the for the spin and gets as much of a buzz as you, as you do. And I think once you have those things sorted, you should be all right. Great advice. <laughs> Thanks. Brian, thank you so much for, for coming down. I'm